In this episode, we're going to take a look at deals with the devil and tell one story in particular, followed by several shorter ones. You'll want to check out the link to loreandlegends.net in the episode description as well. So here we go. Toward the close of the 18th century, there was pointed out to visitors in the old town of Krakow, the house of the magician Tordowski. In his youth, Tordowski had followed the study of medicine, and with such industry, the eagerness and such a clear mind did he practice his profession, that it was not long before he was the most celebrated doctor in all of Poland. But Twardowski was not satisfied with this. He craved greater, and still greater, power. At last one day, as he was reading, he found an old book of magic that for which he had been long seeking, the formula for summoning the devil. When night came, a storm had risen, but caring not for that, he hurried away to the lonely mountain, Kremenki. There, in a rudely constructed hut, he began his incantations. Before long, there was an earthquake. Great rocks were loosened. The ground opened up at Tordowski's feet, and flames leaped out. And in the flames appeared the evil one himself, in the form of a man clad in a red cloak with the well-known pointed red cap. What do you wish? The devil asked. The power of your most secret wisdom was the answer. And how is this to be done? You shall make me the most celebrated of all the learned men of the country, and shall besides give me such happiness as no man has ever enjoyed upon this earth before. So be it, said the devil, but on condition that at the end of seven years I gain possession of your soul. You may take me, answered Twardowski, but only in Rome may you have power over me. Thither at the end of seven years I will go. The devil hesitated at this clause, but thinking of the fun he could have in the holy city, finally agreed. Leaning against the wall of the stone, he wrote the compact, with Twardowski, making a slight wound in his arm, signed with his own blood. When Twardowski descended the mountain and made his way, book under arm through the valley, he heard the bells in all the towers of the city ringing out clearly and solemnly on the still night air. He listened wondering at the unaccustomed noise, then hurried into the town, inquiring from everyone he met what the occasion was. But no one seemed to have heard the sound. Then a deep feeling of sadness came over him as he realized the meaning of the bells. They were the funeral knell of his own soul. When morning came, however, doubts were forgotten, and Twardowski was glad to have the devil at his command. The first thing he demanded was to have all the silver of Poland gathered together in one place and covered over with great mounds of sand. Similar requests follows, and it was not long before the devil repented of his bargain. One day it would please Twardowski to fly without wings through the air, on another to delight the crowd, to gallop backward on a rooster, on another to float in a boat without a rudder or sail, accompanied by some maiden who for the moment had inflamed his heart. One day, by the use of his magic mirror, he set fire to the castle of an enemy over a mile away. This last feat made him greatly feared by people far and wide. At last, the seven years were up. The devil appeared to Twardowski and said, Twardowski, the time of our pact is over, and I command you to fulfill your promise and go to Rome. What shall I do there? Give me your immortal soul, was the answer. Do you think I'm a fool? asked Twardowski. You gave me your promise to go to Rome after seven years. Ha! That I have already done, said Twardowski, and I did not promise to stay in Rome. Noble deceiver, exclaimed the evil one. Stupid devil, cried Twardowski. Then, after a struggle, the devil vanished, and Twardowski returned home. For over a year he pored incessantly over his books of magic, until at last he found a formula for warding off death. Then he called his disciple Famulus to him and explained that he was going to test the formula. You have always obliged me without question, said Twardowski, and I expect you to now. Take this knife and thrust it into my heart. God forbid, cried Famulus. Why are you frightened? I know what I'm doing. Take the knife and kill me as the parchment directs. I cannot. You must, insisted Twardowski. It is impossible. 
No more exclamations. Do as I tell you. Oh, ho, ho, wailed Famulus. Strike, thundered Twardowski, or I will kill you this instant. Then Famulus did as he was bid and forced the blade into his master's heart. Twardowski uttered a low cry fell and was soon dead. Famulus dropped, trembling into a chair, and covered his face with his hands. Then he remembered that he must read the remainder of the parchment in order to find out what he must do to restore the body to life. Then he set about the task, severed the limbs of the dead body, and worked and brewed and distilled until the elixir described in the parchment was prepared. With the elixir, he rubbed the members of the master's body, put them together, and laid the corpse in a coffin. Then he buried on the following night, explaining to Twardowski's friends that such had been the master's wish. Now, the parchment stated that the body must remain in the grave for seven years, seven months, seven days, and seven hours. So Famulus could do nothing but wait. At last, the time had expired, and on a snowy, cold December night, he found his way to the grave. He dug out the coffin, brushed off the snow and earth, opened the casket and found, not the body of Twardowski, but that of a child who lay sleeping on a bed of fragrant violets. The child is like Twardowski, Famulus thought, and he gathered him up under his cloak and carried him home. The next morning, the child was the size of a twelve-year-old, and after seven weeks, he was a full-grown man. Twardowski, who now seemed quite himself, only younger and stronger, thanked Famulus and resumed again his study of magic. He desired above all things to be freed forever from his compact with the devil. This he read in one of the books he might do if he would brave the terrors of the underworld. So Twardowski determined to enter the gates of hell. At his magic speech, the ground opened and he began the path of descent. Blue flames lit the way. Deeper and deeper he went through the dark and winding passages. At last he reached the underworld itself, and many awful sights did he behold. And the further he went, the more frightened did he become. He could not help feeling that the devil had plotted something against him. Finally he found himself in a small room, and cast a hasty glance around, looking for a means of escape. Seeing a child in a cradle in one corner of the room, he seized it hastily, threw his cloak around it, and was about to leave when the door opened, and the evil one entered. He made a respectful bow and said, Will you be good enough to go with me now? Why so, said Twardowski, obstinately, because of our agreement. But, said the magician, only in Rome have you power over me. Yes, the devil replied, and Rome is the name of this house. You think you trick me by a pun, but you cannot. I carry this talisman of innocence. And throwing aside his cloak, he disclosed the sleeping child. Anger showed in the face of the devil, but he stepped nearer to Twardowski and said softly, What are you thinking of, Twardowski? Have you forgotten your promise? The nobleman's word is sacred to him. Pride awoke in the breast of the magician. I must keep my word, he said laying the child back in the crib and surrendering himself. On the shoulders of the devil, two wings appeared. Like the wings of a bat, he seized Twardowski and flew away with him, mounting higher and higher into the night. The magician was so terrified and suffered such anguish in the clutches of the evil one that in a few moments he was changed into an old man, but he did not lose consciousness. At last, so high were they that cities appeared like flies and Krakow with its mighty turrets like two spiders. Deeply moved, Twardowski looked down upon the scene of all his struggles and all his joys. But higher and higher they went, higher than any eagle has ever flown, and more lonely and more fearful did it seem to Twardowski. Only occasionally bright stars passed by them, or fiery meteors, leaving a long streak of light behind. At last they came to the moon, which stared at them with dead eyes. Then a song that Twardowski had read in his mother's hymn book rose to his lips. As he repeated mechanically the prayer his mother had taught him, an angel suddenly appeared and said, Satan, let Twardowski go, and you, Twardowski, hang you there between heaven and earth to atone for your sin until the last judgment. Then you will be reunited with your mother in heaven. The prayer which you remembered in your hour of need has saved you. And so, According to the story, 
Twardowski is suspended somewhere in the dark of the moon to this very day. This Faustian legend comes from Poland and is a classic in the same vein as Guthy's Faust, where the main character makes a deal with the devil, their soul in exchange for prominence. In this tale, Twardowski tries to outsmart the devil with the clause about only being able to have his soul claimed while he's in Rome. But in the long run, the devil outsmarts Twardowski by getting him into a house in hell that is called Rome. Twardowski is ultimately saved by an angel after he remembers a prayer that his mother used to say. But there was another catch. Now he would be stranded on the moon until final judgment, and he remains there to this day. In all cases, the idea is that you sell yourself, your future, and your soul for a fleeting moment of fame or security. So let's look at a few other cases, starting with the original, Deal with the Devil. It isn't actually Faust. It's the story of St. Theophilus of Adana. Yes, a man who is now titled a saint allegedly made a deal with the devil. Theophilus was a deacon of the church in the early 6th century. One day, he was approached about becoming a bishop. The humble Theophilus turned down the promotion, and it was given to someone else. Well, that someone else became bishop and then stripped Theophilus of his title and his privileges as deacon. Theophilus got so angry, he reached out to the devil himself to undo his predicament and make him the bishop in exchange for his renunciation of God. Theophilus then became bishop for many years, but as time wore on, he grew older and wiser. He realized what a foolish mistake he'd made. Eternity was a much bigger issue than revenge and status. He fasted for 40 days, much like Jesus in the desert, and much like our protagonist Twardowski, appealed to heaven. Heaven then visited him and informed him that since he was penitent and asked for forgiveness, his sins were in fact forgiven, and the contract he'd signed with the devil was destroyed. And that is why he is now also, at times called, Saint Theophilus the Penitent. Theophilus' story was one of the inspirations for Guthy's Faust, and bears more than a few similarities with that of Twardowski, especially the ending, where he is saved by an angel, or in Theophilus's case, the Virgin Mary, who voids his deal with the devil. So let's finish this episode with a couple more modern deals with the devil. In the late 1700s, wealthy American general Jonathan Moulton is said to have made a deal with the devil. There are a few versions of this story if you go searching, but the general idea was that his deal was to have his boots filled with gold and thus become all the wealthier. The devil agreed, but the general thought he would outsmart the devil, so he removed the soles from his boots so that the gold would keep coming. When the devil realized something wasn't right, he inspected the boots and was filled with rage. Moulton's house was set on fire, and though the general still thought he'd have his gold when it was out, he searched the ashes and found nothing. He had lost everything. When he died, his body allegedly vanished from the coffin, and it was filled with gold stamped with the seal of Satan, and the townspeople buried the cursed gold in an unmarked grave. Blue's legend of the early 1900s, Robert Johnson, is another one. No one recalls Johnson having been particularly talented with the guitar, until one evening outside his home when he purportedly met the devil. The devil handed him a guitar, and Johnson became one of the most notable guitarists of all time, though fame never quite followed him. Johnson died in 1938 at age 27, after drinking some mysteriously poisoned whiskey at a show. Bob Dylan is another artist who once claimed in an interview to have made a deal with the devil. His soul in exchange for fame and fortune. Bob Dylan is still around. And if you go to loreandlegends.net, I'll link to the video where you can see Bob Dylan saying this for himself. Now I can't help but wonder how often people make deals with the devil, both real or metaphorical, and how grand the requests might be. We shouldn't forget the devil himself tried to tempt Jesus with the whole of the earth if he would but kneel and worship him. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Follow me on Twitter at LorenLegends3. Also check out the Lauren Legends YouTube channel if you like listening on YouTube. And if you really like the show, consider leaving me a tip over at buymeacoffee.com slash Lauren Legends or via Red Circle. 
There's also a new exclusive subscriber feed, available through Red Circle as well, with several bonus episodes that aren't found in the free feed and many more coming in the future. Find your way to all of this by clicking that link to loreandlegends.net in the episode description, which will also include some additional content related to this episode, as well as links to all the sources and stories that I used. That's all for this episode. See you next time.